Uh, yeah, I'm here to share with you my 12-year journey studying a group of organizations that we used to call genes of people with great kung fu. These organizations that were the most secure, the most compliant, but also the most operationally effective. And also, interestingly, they had the highest rate of project throughput and organizational change. So I'm going to share with you some of the biggest lessons I learned in that journey, and some of which uh, made it into a book called The Visible Ops Handbook, which uh, I gave my one copy that I had in my bag to Dave uh, here. Um, and I wrote that when I was the CTO of Tripwire, where I was uh, there for about 13 years. And uh, I guess one of the big surprises to me in that journey was that you know, people actually care about controls, right? The goal of, you know, uh, that you know, when you have great operations organizations and great security organizations and great application development organizations, you know, they all, you know, they don't actually throw each other underneath the bus. They actually have one thing in common that they care greatly about, which is controls. In other words, controls are what uh, is in common for all of them to achieve their goals. So, uh, you know, our goal when we wrote the visual handbook was really to try to capture and codify what made those organizations tick. You know, how, how can we capture and codify their good to great transformation? And, uh, you know, I think we did that pretty well in the visual ops handbook. Um, but today I'm going to share with you maybe some of the platitudes of information security. In the ideal, information security is viewed as a uh, business enabler, that uh, we're helping the business win, that the business recognizes information security as, uh, well, one, on their side, and some of that they want on their uh, side. But I think that the sad fact is that uh, the, dismal, the more dismal reality is that information security is uh, often viewed as a shrill, hysterical, bureaucratic people who love to slow things down, that suck the will to live out of everybody we touch. Right? Uh, how many people here have a friend who has been labeled any of those words? <laughs> right, so I have friends like that too. And so um, I'm going to share with you um, what I've learned over the last two years, and you know, what I've had the privilege of doing since uh, I left Tripar was to surround myself with the best experts in application development, DevOps, operations, security, compliance, uh, the lean um, manufacturing movement, the Toyota production system. I'm going to show you what I learned. And you know, I think there's a movement coming called DevOps and a security twist to it called rugged DevOps, which I think is actually one of the last best chances for information security to become relevant. And worse, <laughs> you know, if we miss that boat, well then uh, we're going to be lost at sea for another 20 years. So um, uh, briefly, uh, when I talk about high-performing IT organizations, um, there's actually something very interesting about them. You know, literally what we found when we started studying them in 1999 was that in a 10-minute conversation, you could actually tell that there was something different about these organizations. And uh, one of the things that we noticed was that when you look at who was leading these organizations, whether it was information security or operations, they came from one of three backgrounds. They were either non-commissioned officers in the military, chemical engineers, or auditors. Not just CPA, green eye shade wearing bean counters, they're IT auditors. <laughs> <laughs> so can anyone speculate on what those three professions have in common? Non-commissioned officers in the military, where they give live ammunition to 18-year-olds. Chemical engineers, where they have long, elaborate recipes, right? And uh, where endothermic can become exothermic, and then auditors. Anyone? Controls. Have a hypothesis? Controls. Controls, I like that, but more. What, what common values do they have? Discipline. Discipline, I like that. Good, thank you, Susan. Bad things happen if you break the rules. Oh, high outage cost, high consequence, yep. They like the rules. They like the rules, right? They favor rigor and discipline, right? I like the words rigor and discipline. Right. Uh, what I learned in uh, studying non-commissioned officers in the military, right, is that uh, they have high outage costs. They give live ammunition to those eighteen-year-olds. I learned later in restaurant operations that they don't even give knives to eighteen-year-olds because the accident rate when you can buy eighteen-year-olds knives and raw carrots, the accident rate is so high that you know it becomes untenable with the insurance companies. Chemical engineers, uh, you know, uh, you missequence a couple steps, you lose fingers. And then, uh, you know, auditors, they just love controls. Incidentally, uh, I'm going to share with you sort of the rugged, rugged DevOps movement, what I learned in the research, uh, the two projects I'm working on. And then at the end of this um, uh, talk, I'm actually, we, I, we have assembled for you, Adam and I, um, the service manager petting zoo. So uh, uh, we're going to have uh, three people who are not like you. Um, uh, they're, they come from the service management space, and I thought it would be interesting to sort of just have a little panel uh, so that uh, you feel comfortable with them. You can rehearse your best lines on them, you know, without fear of consequence. All right, so uh, we talk about high-performing IT organizations um, from a cultural perspective, uh, you know, a philosophical perspective. When you benchmark over 1,300 IT organizations, we actually found that there were very quantitatively measurable differences between high performers and non-high performers in a way that you could measure with a ruler, a stopwatch, or dollar signs. And so here's a way that uh, here's what we found. And I guess the big surprise was that 
high performers outperform their medium and low performing peers by a factor of four to five x. In other words, they're four to five times more productive uh, than the non-high performers. As measured by, they had the fewest number of repeat audit findings. They had typically one quarter of the number of repeat audit findings. And they were, they were spending about a third of the amount of effort prepping and liaising with auditors. So they had the best posture compliance. That also translated to security. Uh, they, uh, they were five times more likely to detect breaches by an automated control. So Murphy does exist. High performers have security breaches too. The question is, did you detect it sort of internal to the organization, or did your neighbor, or your business partner, or your mom, or you know, say, you know, I just read about a uh, security breach in the New York Times. Did you know about that, right? And consequently, they're five times less likely to have these security breaches result in some sort of loss of it, right? So they found and fixed security breaches faster. But so. We saw the compliance effectiveness, security effectiveness, but you know, astoundingly, right? Uh, there are also you can see the effectiveness improvements, uh, effectiveness differences in operations as well. They were implementing and auth authorizing 14 times as many changes with far better outcomes. They had one half the change failure rate, uh, and when things went wrong, because Murphy does exist, right? One quarter of the first fixed failure rate. So this is one of my favorite metrics. When something goes wrong, how good are you at fixing the first? How good are you at fixing things the first time? Well, because they were so much better at that by a factor of four, they had one tenth the amount of time for several outages. In other words, uh, when something goes wrong, right? Uh, typically, the outages were fixed in one tenth the time. And because they were doing such a great job in controlling unplanned work, they're getting more than you know three times the amount of planned work done. I'm sorry, for that. they're spending one third of the amount of time of unplanned work, and unplanned work isn't free. Unplanned work comes at the expense of planned work, right? And so they're getting more projects done, eight times as many. And then because at the conclusion of those projects, right, you should, know, you should feel viscerally at the uh, end of every application development project, there's one more application to be managed in production. So consequently, there are six times as many applications you know, being managed in production. So before I go any further, does this uh, resonate with you? Does this seem like a too cavalier assertion? Uh, can you give me a thumbs up? Gene, thumbs up, uh, I buy this. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe? <laughs> yeah, by the way, and I see a lot of you writing stuff down. If you're interested in slides, just I'll give you my email address at the end, and you can just email me and just say slides, and I'll send them to you. Uh, so this was based on uh, benchmarking from uh, uh, over three waves of studies spanning 1,300 IT organizations. So um, what we found when we, any questions, comments? Look, yeah. Quick, quick. quick. Yeah. So is this how you determined that an IT organization was high performing, or this is you determined they were high performing, and then this is what you found in common? Uh, so, really right. so the goal of the benchmark study was to link controls and performance, and we use clustering to say, hey, what are the you know clusters of you know the archetypal links of controls and performance, and uh, we found that uh, you could actually predict this performance by a certain number of controls. In other words, right. controls can predict performance. So they, they correlated, but yeah. Does that answer your question? Well enough. Okay. Um, all right. Another so, question? Yeah. What does the spread look like between the high oh, and low? Oh, man. Um, high performers have these incredibly tight variances. The bell curves look like this. With low performers, the bell curves look like this, right? I mean, like the, the variance was out of control for low performers. With high performers, I mean, it was this incredible tight clustering around each one of these metrics. So, sort of what you would expect, right? Uh, without controls, things are random. Yeah. Was that divided by industry, or were there any Expand other? all industries, right? And that was so important because uh, we uh, we found a certain circular argument among non-high performers. Like, we don't have to be a high performer because we're not a bank. We have banks because we don't need to be high performers because we're not a stock exchange. Stock exchange is that we don't need to be a high performer because we're not a telco. Telcos would say we don't have to be a high performer because we're not a bank. So we kind of covered that. In, any groups of organizations that were better than or were worse uh, yeah, I, I think the higher the consequence, right, uh, we found like in financial services and telco, they typically had more high performers because, uh, you know, there was a Darwinistic force at work. Um, and uh, I think we did find that uh, the lowest performers typically were like service companies. Um, uh, I, I can't remember the other ones. Hotel companies. Right, and that matches the PCI breach studies. Yeah. Did you find that certain aspects within an organization, maybe the Windows Server group versus other groups? No. We, uh, there was no correlation between technology and performance. And, and you know, Which is interesting because it matches anecdotal evidence that uh, says, uh, hey, you can take the best service level from the OS 390 group, but then when the win when they retire and they get taken over by the Windows NT admins, right, you get service levels that look like a Windows NT4 workstation, not the 390. So. <laughs> I've never had this many questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> is that data available even if it's anonymized? Yeah. 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 Uh, just email me. Sure. Uh, write research. And I'll send you, the, 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 <laughs> you got the answers yeah. for me. <laughs> yeah. Did your study span time? No. 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 It was just a snapshot. In, uh, uh, I don't even know. Longitudinal. Whatever it is. I mean, it's just a snapshot. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, and, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'll stop that real soon, boy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, that word. No more questions. <laughs> um, so, one of the things that we uh, that caused us to write the Visual Office book is that we found that you know uh, not only did the leaders have certain values in common, but there were certain cultural traits that uh, we noticed. Right, and uh, there were three of them that really sort of popped out at us. One of them is what we call a culture change management, meaning that you know whenever you go to the organization, and say what is the number, what is the only simple number of unauthorized changes? You know, what do you suppose the answer is? Zero, exactly right. So, you know, but and, you know that kind of was interesting, right? So we would challenge it, saying, "Hey, isn't change management bureaucratic? Doesn't it slow things down? Doesn't it suck the world to live out of everybody touches?" And they would say, "Absolutely not, right?" Uh, Mike Prospect from uh, the New York Stock Exchange at the time, uh, now they got acquired, uh, he said, "You know, we do over a thousand production changes per week with a success rate of over ninety-nine point five percent." I was like, "Wow, that does seem like a very high rate of change, right? Significantly higher than what we found in non-high performers." Um, so you know they could show evidence, right, that uh, they were using change management to avert risky outcomes, right, and uh, you know achieve kind of the outcomes they want. The second thing that we found was a culture of causality, and you know I think the, the statistic that really kind of brought this to life for us was uh, uh, something came, that came from Microsoft, from the uh, Microsoft Operational Framework Study, and they found that their best customers with the best service levels, the best customer satisfaction, were rebooting the servers. 20 times less often than their average customers, and they were having five times fewer blue screens of death, right? So when we saw the statistic, I mean, uh, we fell out of our chairs, uh, my two other co-authors and I, I mean, it, because it would match exactly what we found in, it was like the antithesis of what we found in our high performers. High performers know that 80% of the time when something goes wrong is due to a change, and 80% of the meantime repairs trying to figure out what changed. So where do you suppose high performers look first? Change. change. Exactly right. They look at the authorized schedule changes, they look at the detected changes, and then they will use that to drive their uh, problem resolution outcomes, right? And instead of what the low performers do, they reboot things. Right? If something doesn't work, <laughs> the server doesn't work, reboot the server next to it. If that doesn't work, blame <laughs> all the servers. If that doesn't work, blame the firewall guy, right? Because you know, firewall guys are always causing outages. You know, that has to cause, you know, that has to be the cause. So this is what drives up main time repair. Right, and so it drives down first fix rates. And so the third thing that we found was that high performers had this ruthless desire to, you know, let's call it a culture plan work. They all wanted to find variance early and eradicate it in a planned way, in less urgency. In other words, uh, Jennifer Bate, she was the CISO at Bear Stearns for 11 years. She said, for us, it was like a low fuel light in a car. Right? When that low fuel light indicator went on, right, our goal was to fix things in a planned way in a week with less urgency, right, as opposed to Critical service down, security breach, we have to drop everything. Anyone who can sort of carry a bucket and a you know, mm -hmm. bucket full of gas, right, you know, you're mobilized to sort of restore service to the, the, truck, uh, the fleet of trucks. Right, so the way you measured that was uh, what percentage of time was spent on unplanned work, right? And so high performers were spending 5% or less of their time on unplanned work, where higher performers, you know, that's high performers, lower performers were spending 40, 60, 80% or more of their time on unplanned work. And, you know, incidentally, you're right, you know, one of the biggest causes of rework in the organization, which is just another form of unplanned work, is security, right? I mean, whenever we do that vulnerability scan, right, we, you know, say, kick it back into development, right, that's unplanned work, right? Uh, whether it's in the OS space or in the application space. Um, how am I doing here so far? Make, uh, resonate with you? No. Yeah. Great. So this is what we captured and codified in the VizOps handbook, and just to sort of, you know, frame one of our goals. The goal was really to describe in a prescriptive way, right, uh, how, did the high performers achieve their good to great transformation? Unlike COVID, seven, uh, whatever they call it, 7799, uh, BS 20s. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 yep. that's right, Susan got. Um, right, those are, all just, those are all descriptive frameworks, like ITIL, COVID, uh, um, the ISO series, right? Those are sort of like an extensive catalog of controls, catalog of processes, uh, right? They don't say what to do, right? Though, you know, when you write the great American novel, Right, uh, you don't have to use every word. You just need to use the words that you know help you get to your goal. 
right? Our goal is to you know, say, here's the four projects you need to do to implement and operationalize the right controls, right? That simultaneously increase operation, security, and uh, application control <coughs> outcomes. So let me just share with you before I go into the DevOps. Um, uh, what is DevOps? One of the really exciting things that came out of the benchmarking was it's one thing to know what high performance looked like, right? It's actually just as important to know what controls correlate with performance. Our goal is to link controls with performance. And so what we found after the end of the third study was that you know, literally asking three questions could predict 60% of performance. In other words, all the ventures I've talked about, you could literally ask three <coughs> questions and predict with 60% accuracy all of those measures, compliance, security, operations, uh, product visibility. So here are the questions. To what extent does the organization define, monitor, and enforce some sort of standardized configuration strategy, right? Obviously from application, you know, from applications, databases, OSs, networking, firewalls, you know, all that, right? Virtualization, right? You know, this is so, you know, to what extent does the organization define what is a known good state, right? Uh, you know, this you know, trusted uh, state that uh, security is reviewed, that, that we have some mastery over, right? This is monitored. In other words, you know, what to, uh, are we monitoring production configurations to true them up with uh, the known good states? And which, to what extent are we enforcing it? Meaning, you know, are we holding managers accountable that what's in production actually matches you know, these defined configurations? Secondly, to what extent does the organization define, monitor, and enforce some sort of process discipline, you know, especially around the change in configuration uh, uh, areas? Right, in other words, uh, you know, they're defined, right, in policy somewhere, they're monitored, right, so their production controls actually monitoring the release, control, and configuration processes, but then enforced, right, you know, just like we were talking about the cultural change management. Is management holding managers accountable that, uh, you know, people are following the process? And then third, uh, is to what extent does the organization define, monitor, and enforce some sort of controlled access to production? Right, and so three years ago, right, uh, I would always use the uh, example of developers, right? You know, you never want developers in production, right? Uh, because, you know, give me a developer who uh, doesn't put a backdoor into production, right? You know, I'll show you one who can't follow a mirror, right? But now, with DevOps, right, everyone knows developers are supposed to be in production, so that's, that's not productive. So let's talk about someone that we all hate, DBAs, right? Mm -hmm. Who said do DBAs, you know, have daily access to production doing direct data edits, fixing up data because, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, uh, data quality issues because the application so screwed up, right? I think whether you're talking about developers or DBAs or networking admins or firewall admins, you know, the, the, what this really is indicating is to what extent do people have to have emergency access to production? The more that happens, you know, is actually just is negatively uh, correlated with performance. So these three things, you put them into a spreadsheet, you can actually predict almost all of, all of the performance measures that we talked about. Before we go any further, any uh, questions, comments? <laughs> uh, I reserve the right to cut it off after 10. <laughs> anyway, uh, is this resonate with your own experience? Yeah? Or do you care? <laughs> lack of standardized configuration, lack of process discipline, lack of, I, I recognize all of you. Okay. Uh, by the way, does this resonate with you in a way that you actually care about? I mean, does this... Uh, how many people here would love to, how many people here have seen you know, their best friends suffer from being in an organization that doesn't have these? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. That's good. Um, all right, so let me tell you about the, maybe the darkest moment in my journey. So we wrote Visible Ops, right? Uh, we sold 200,000 copies. We did the, uh, we benchmarked, we did all this benchmarking. We, raised, we created a nonprofit called the IT Process Institute that was the, uh, you know, that was sort of meant to sort of promote this. We raised over $1.5 million to actually do the benchmarking studies. And I actually found that, um, I guess in my ideal, and kind of my vision of this, you know, this would actually cause the business to care, right? Um, and what I found was that uh, to, it meant a lot to, uh, by most definitions, uh, it didn't really cause the business to care, right? Uh, so, <laughs> and I think it's because it might have actually felt too much like a platitude, which I hate. Like one of uh, the VisBots uh, co-authors, uh, George Spafford, I, I will always like call him when he uh, says a platitude. A banal, trite, or stale remark. Like, uh, for example, buy low, sell high. Right, technically true, right, at the 90,000 foot level, but you know, uh, actually quite useless, right, because it doesn't say how. <laughs> right, and let me give you some uh, platitudes in the security domain. You know, if we as information security practitioners can learn to speak in the language of the business, people will care. 
because we'll help foster the right tone at the top, we'll build a genuine, trusted working relationship with our fellow stakeholders in development, uh, operations, audits, and the, and the business, and uh, we can be savvy and take advantage of compelling events like the Sony Security Breach and Anonymous, right? And we'll create real security programs so compliance will be free. So we take control uh, of the compliance program from the auditors because security is everyone's responsibility, meaning no one's responsibility. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the auditors tell us what security is, we're going to do that because we're going to do plan, do, check, act, assess, you know, assess, plan, design, assess, plan, design, and see, monitor. And then, you know, if we build the right control environment, the right security, compliance, and operations outcomes will come, right? Here's the problem. I said this, like, you know, um, to <laughs> yeah, the people I've worked with for years, right? It's like, yeah, that, that's mine, right? So uh, that sucks, right? How, if you can imagine how crappy it feels to sort of do all this work and say, you know what, I think all we did was generate a platitude. <laughs> um, so it was actually a pretty dark moment in my journey, but not as dark as this. So uh, um, I went to seek advice from uh, my Yoda, right? His name is Ari Bailoff. And one of the proudest moments of my life was when Ari Bailoff uh, wrote the foreword to the second edition of the Visible Ops book. Right? He was the CTO of VeriSign, so arguably they were one of the single points of failure for the entire internet because they owned the DNS lookup service. Right? They had to grow capacity by a factor of 40,000 when Moore's Law only gave them one fortieth of that. Right? So it was a phenomenal engineering challenge, a phenomenal security uh, program, it was a phenomenal operational program. Right? And uh, yeah, it was just great to have him read the book. By the way, I've never actually seen Ari Bailoff smile. And when he does, I think he's just gritting his teeth, right? No, but a uh, really great guy. So I, I actually asked him, uh, you know, can you give me some advice, right? We did all this work, many of it, you know, with uh, his advice to see if we could actually generate, you know, uh, something that would cause the business to care, right? And, and here's, like, I think what I might have said to him, and I don't think I actually showed him a PowerPoint slide, but it's possible, right? Uh, you know, I think that my discontent came from Operations and security were, was viewed as tactical. Security was too often marginalized. Um, infirm, information security and compliance programs were sucking all the air out of the room. Uh, the activation energy to actually do successful transformation programs seemed to be too high. Right? And the people who were actually sort of um, seeming to sort of get whatever they want with development. In other words, information security, operations were always overshadowed by whatever the development people wanted. Right? They use up all the time and schedule, leaving no time <laughs> in the end for us, right? Even though all issues are amplified 10 times in production, right? And that's where all of the technical debt builds up over time. Um, and we know that operation is a constraint for the entire organization. So why doesn't anyone care, right? Um, so, um, so here's what Eric Bailoff told me, right? Um, so it's like when you thought you hit bottom, right? It turns out bottom is a lot lower than you thought. He said, uh, Gene, in 40 years, everybody will understand this. So in the meantime, right, uh, so in the meantime, you just need to do a better job of qualifying. Right, uh, he said, uh, don't make a moral issue out of it. <laughs> so here I am, yeah, I, just, I thought he was going to you know, show me how to do better business cases, or he's going to you know, uh, send me on a sales training journey, or he's going to have me walk in the woods and you know, sort of think deeply. But instead, that was the best he came up with. And I think I literally had tears sort of welling up in my eyes, right, because I kind of interpreted that as him saying, Gene, I've ceased to care. <laughs> right? you no, know, it was interesting then, but I have bigger fish to fry. But, and I actually left that dinner in uh, Palo Alto like a wreck you know, for days. I mean, I was, uh, 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 <laughs> yeah, I, it's the feeling, the emotions were like one of utter betrayal, right? It's like, wow, how could you do that to me, right? But it turns out that, you know, he, it was actually one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten, right? Because he actually encouraged me to work with. Uh, his group, he was then CTO of Yahoo, and he had me work with the search advertising group, uh, which is a $5 billion a year business, you know, doing all the display banner ad serving. And by working with them, I started to see something that I started to see everywhere else. So like in Sixth Sense, like the dead body, the dead people are everywhere. <laughs> right? I started to see something that was so much larger that in my mind, it sort of kind of created the basis of a real business case. So here's, here's what I started to see. Operations will see that fragile applications are prone to failure. In other words, a lot of crap that you know uh, developers put into production, right, that break all the time, right. And whenever something goes wrong, it takes a long time to figure out what bit got flipped, right. And you know, you know, what's not being a moral issue out of it, right? The real thing that we have a grievance about is that the detective control was not a monitoring control in operations. It was a salesperson in Vietnam saying, "Hey, why are Spanish ads being served in our networks and upside down, right?" And no one knows. 
So the, it was, took too much time to uh, figure out you know, what changed. It took too long to re restore service. So the operations group is uh, spending too much time firefighting and doing unplanned work. And you know, uh, compounded by the fact that these security jackasses are, you know, keep, you know, could be giving us even more urgent security group work, right? When I say jackasses, I say that with love and uh, endearment, right? <laughs> but because we're uh, spending so much time on unplanned work, our planned work isn't completing, and uh, we're finding that uh, we do these expensive acquisitions of uh, online properties, and frustrated customers are leaving, and our market share goes down, and suddenly the business starts missing their Wall Street commitments that they made to the, you know, to the public uh, world and the analysts. And now the business makes even larger commitments to Wall Street, right? Often dreamed up by art majors, saying, hey, you know, we might have blown that deadline, but you know, we're going to make it up by this even more audacious program, right? So suddenly development sees something. More urgent data-driven projects put into the queue, right? So now we have even more fragile code put into production, which even, you know, because we're taking so many shortcuts, they're also less secure. By the way, is this resonating with anybody? Anybody have a friend see something like this? <laughs> gets even more insidious, right? Now that you have more fragile code put into production, deployments start failing, right? Things that we deployed for years, you know, things for years, right? So they start having issues, right? Things that used to take an hour to deploy, take three hours, take a day, take two days, takes three days, so you, now it's no, you can't even do it in a weekend, take a week to two weeks to four weeks to a month, you know, in some cases months to deploy, right? Because you have 1,300 steps, right? And so the, the deployments become so heavyweight, and awful, right, that the business says, you know what, we can't afford to do this many releases. We're going to lengthen the deployment interval, right, to amortize the cost of deployments, which means there's even more moving pieces during each deployment, which means it's harder to diagnose, which means that we're now spending the, our best people, right, in ops, dev, information security, right, you know, uh, urgently working deployment issues, which they can't, means that they can't fix underlying issues. And so uh, now you have uh, ever growing backlog of crap that needs to be fixed that will never be gotten to, and an ever increasing amount of tension between ops and development. And incidentally, where is security in this? This is like a tribal war between ops and development. Security is like a uh, shadow. I mean, security is not even in the zone, right? I mean, uh, luckily, we're not between it. But uh, you know, uh, they're too busy fighting each other. So. Um, what I found was that this happened in the large internet companies, and it seems to happen in almost every organization where IT is rely, you know, being relied upon for operations or project delivery. Uh, just as a just a little sales check, um, how many people here have seen this before? This terrible downward spiral. Yeah. So isn't that interesting? So I guess the big aha for me was that this, the business missing Wall Street commitments. That is not a VP of operations, that is not an IT operations problem, right? That is a business problem. And I, you know, I guess, in my mind, that was a very cathartic aha moment, right? Because I felt like, you know what? Our job as practitioners, whether it was security operations or development, is just to merely point out this, right? Is by the time, you know, the, the business decisions that we're making and resulting in the business missing, you know, commitments they're making to the outside world, to customers or analysts or whatever, at that point, you know, if if we've done that, then I think we've done our job, right? And more than that, you know, I, I think the Deming quote is, survival isn't mandatory, right? And at a certain point, you know, uh, this is as far as we can take it. You know, uh, if the business isn't smart enough to take the right corrective actions, then uh, it's not really our problem. I mean, it is our problem, but you know, it's not our, our problem. It's the domains of control, influence, and concern. Um, so, for me, that was a sort of the big aha moment. And it seems to be one that every IT organization faces because every organization is simultaneously pressured to respond quickly to urgent needs, which means make more changes, as well as provide stable, secure, predictable IT services, which means make no changes at all. Right? And so <laughs> yeah, the problem is that yeah, that is a core chronic conflict that every organization will face. So, um, but we know that high performers have somehow figured out how to break you know, that cycle. Right? And I think that's what the benchmarking you know, really... Uh, you know, informed us is that you know that it is possible to break that, be simultaneously more nimble, more operationally uh, available, more secure, more compliant. Um, but then there was this amazing movement called DevOps that I think kind of blew all of our findings out of the water. In other words, it didn't invalidate it, but it showed just how good organizations can get. 
So this started off as a uh, presentation that John Alsbaugh gave at the Velocity Conference in 2009. He went on the record saying, we are doing 10 deploys per day, right, because Dev and Ops are working together uh, you know, at Flickr, which is where he was the VP of uh, Operations at. And this sort of blew everyone away because you know, people were more, uh, the cadence that people expect is, hey, we do one major deploy quarter, right, not 10 deploys a day. Um, and you know, the president uh, in his slides said, you know, he's saying, you know, developers and operations just don't get along, right? You know, Spock is, you know, development. He's a little bit weird. He's a little <laughs> boss. He thinks a lot. Whereas Scott, he just loves turning knobs, right? He's easily excited. Yells a lot in emergencies. Um, and so they're very temperamentally, temperamentally very different. But you know, uh, what, the way he achieved his breakthroughs is creating a DevOps team where ops. Who would think like developers, and developers could think like operations, right? And by the way, in this scenario, right, where is security? Security is like the red, you know, the red shirt on the away party, right? You know, it's like the expendable guy, right? Uh, but and you know, properly embedded, you know, properly done, security becomes embedded into each one of their jobs. In fact, Scotty and Spock would freak out if security wasn't present in the room. Um, all right, and so uh, John Alpha wanted to say, you know what? You need uh, this loving mutually respectful relationship between dev and ops. But, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, as the DevOps community has evolved, right, they're saying, hey, it's not just about DevOps, right? Uh, Theo Schlossnagel, uh, this another luminary in the DevOps space, he's saying, you know what, DevOps is incomplete. And it's interpreted wrong, and it's too isolated. I love this quote, it's like, it's like dot star ops, <laughs> right? It's not just dev, right? It's, you know, dev, security, DBAs, network, right? So it's like, this. <laughs> but I'm not sure it's all that much more. I, I, don't know. I, I wish I had. There's a t shirt that you can buy like that, and uh, I'm waiting for mine. Uh, so there's a group of practitioners, um, including a uh, working collaborator of mine, uh, Josh Corman, and James Wickett, um, who is, leads the OWASP Forum in Austin, Texas, who, uh, who gave this really great talk um, about rugged DevOps. Right? It's like, all right, let's take this movement called DevOps and figure out how do we integrate information security in. So that information security is baked into every part of the SDLC, the deployment and packaging process, and the operations process. And I love what they've done. I mean, I think uh, they are really starting to nail down what is information security's role in you know this new world order to get breakthrough results. So uh, Josh Corman, uh, you know, uh, sort of coined this rugged computing thing, uh, where he was talking about this like four pillars. You, know, you have to be defensible, you have to have operational discipline, like visible ops, you have to have situational awareness, whether we're talking about operation or security or developers, and you have to have effective countermeasures. Um, and they actually started giving these things a name. And I think the trick here that is so neat is they took security and just sort of cloaked it in all the other sort of quality words, right? In other words, the rugged entities are availability, survivability, defensibility, security, longevity, portability, durability, compliability, right? It's just a sort of just another sort of adjective that can fit into any CIO's PowerPoint slides and sort of you know fit in, right? And so there's examples where people just by using a slide like this go from zero percent budget, you know, to three percent budget, right? Just by words, and uh, uh, it's quite the trick. And you know, I think the other thing that's so interesting is that the DevOps movements need us. You know, there's a famous case uh, just this summer where you know Dropbox admits that for a weekend. All of the authentication controls are turned off. Right? <laughs> you know, oops. Right? And you sort of can imagine, right, how this might have happened. Right? A developer sort of turns off the uh, authentication slag, right? Uh, you know, puts in a code fix, and then forgets to turn it back on before doing code commit and deploy. Right? I mean, that is really, you know, uh, somewhere. You know, I think that's a, the, a huge information security failure. Right? So if there's an information security person, they sort of fell asleep the wheel. Right? They sort of didn't do a good job of baking into the daily operational process of development and deployment. So, you know, this is why DevOps needs information security. Um, talking to Adam, and you know, uh, one of the things I sort of wanted to actually make very explicit is, you know, here's why I think DevOps is important. One is, you know, imagine that you're doing a startup, right? Uh, and you are competing with people that are doing 10 deploys a day, and you're doing one deploy a quarter, <laughs> right? I mean, how competitive do you think we'd be doing one deploy a quarter, right? And by the way, that's not even impressive anymore. Amazon, uh, they went on record saying they are doing one deploy in the Amazon enterprise, supporting the Amazon properties, not the cloud customers. They're do for the Amazon property, they're doing one deploy every nine seconds, <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, that is 
nimbleness, right? That is a competitive advantage. The business cares about that. Secondly, it's not just startups. It's happening in the enterprise and public sectors too, right? The cloud, you know, the entire cloud thing. I used to poo-poo saying it was shady. It was just outsourcing another guys. But when you talk about like an organization like like Netflix, where they routinely spin up thousands of you know Amazon instances, and you know when they don't need them, tear them down, right? And uh, they're now shutting down all their data centers. And <coughs> the last Oracle instance will go away probably this year, <laughs> right? That's uh, you know that's was a sign of things to come. But I think you know working in a DevOps environment would be a necessary skill set for information security five years from now. So you know take it for what it's worth. You know, this, these are only my conjectures, but I think it's a real movement and it signifies something that the business will do out of a survival instinct. In other words, it helps deploy features faster, gets operational results, and they need to be more secure. So let's help it as opposed to obstruct it or <laughs> worse yet be bypassed it. But be bypassed by it unknowingly. And so here's why, you know, here's the data point for me that sort of showed me kind of uh, the power of this. So um, I was working with the CTO of AOL, uh, his name is Eric Passmore. And when we sort of worked through, when I showed him this slide uh, with the, his operations peer in there, uh, the CTO at the time, uh, and he said, wow, you're putting your fingers on my biggest problems, right? Uh, we have turbulent install, we have uh, operational stability issues, we have security issues, uh, you know, where security is causing a lot of urgent rework. And he said, you know what? I see that operations is a bottleneck. We can complete the code, but it takes too long for operations to get the code into production. Environments are never available when we need them. In other words, you know, we're ready to deploy, but operations needs two weeks uh, to get the environments ready. And by the way, security needs another two weeks after that, right, to turn around the security reviews. And then when we do the security reviews, we have to roll it all the way back and breaks everything in production and in uh, uh, and in development. This cause chaos and disruption. Turbulent installs it from the norm. And here's an interesting one, right? Because we're developing the code in isolation of the environment, they actually got themselves in a situation uh, where he was describing a code release that was waiting on an environment and they needed to upgrade from the Linux 2.4 kernel to the 2.2.6 kernel to get multi-threading support. And it took operations two quarters to get that done. And his reaction was like, oh my gosh. That was like an equivalent of a two-quarter work stoppage for us, right? We couldn't deploy code for two, you know, for two quarters because of the ops people, right? And he's thinking through what sort of promotions we have to do to our customers, how many promises do we miss because of an operations issue, right? Uh, and so he said, you know what? That's not an operations issue. That is as much my problem as my operations peers. And so I want to help this. Uh, I need to help. So that's the beginning of a loving relationship. Uh, so here's what these breakthroughs look like. Um, uh, you know, the goal is to increase flow of features from dev to production. You know, increasing the throughput, decreasing the process. You know, we're trying to uh, create a trusted system that can move planned work, you know, from dev into production. And how does this differ from visible ops? You know, it's interesting. In visible ops, we talk so much about unplanned work. You know, we sort of defined it. You know, we define. You know, we describe what it felt like, but we sort of missed everything else, right? We never actually talked about planned work. And so, uh, you know, I think what this body work really represents, and what DevOps really represents, is you know the inverse of physical ops, right? It's like how do you actually manage, control, and make plant work flow? Um, so let me tell you about two projects uh, I'm working on. Uh, that my goal is really to sort of help the DevOps movement and uh, help the business realize that we're talking about a problem that they need to care about, right? It's not us pushing a string, get them to sort of help drive this change and pull information security in. By the way, is this interesting? Thumbs up? So the first um, one book is what we're calling the DevOps cookbook. So the goal here is to sort of write the visible ops for DevOps, right? Um, so we call the cookbook. And so the, uh, the people that, um, the team to work on this is a guy named Patrick Dubois, right? Uh, he's the kind of founder of the DevOps movement. He's like one of those genuine, earnest, integrous guys I've ever met. A guy named John Willis, uh, who was the uh, VP of Services for OpsCode. Again, a guy named Mike Orzen, uh, uh, which is like uh, uh, Mr. Bell's smarter brother. <laughs> uh, the latest Shingo Prize winner, and then uh, myself. And the goal is really to say, how do you start and finish these DevOps transformations? And so what is, you know, it's not just DevOps, right? It's about information security, the DBAs, networking. How do they fit in, right? Um, and just let me just share with you briefly kind of what the DevOps piece feels like. 
So typically, the, these DevOps organizations start around like a cloud initiative, or a, it's typically small. I mean, it, it's kind of hard to believe for me initially. It was like, it's typically 10 people or less. But one person says, hey, I need, I need to own the dev resources and the operations resources. And they usually pull in the security guys and architect, right, uh, to help manage uh, the requirements um, and to make sure that we see the entire end-to-end -end flow from, you know, storyboards and agile to the, uh, you know, to the sprints, to deployment, to production, to, to, the, feed, uh, to the, the feedback all the way around. I think the, the biggest aha moment for me was like, wow, well, the first thing that you do is you have dev and ops work together in the first sprints. How many people here work with agile shops? Right. Uh, so for agile, for people who aren't you know, members with agile, you know, they, they work in these sprints, which is the basic unit of development, typically between one, one week and a month. And the goal is that the ever, end of, at the end of every sprint, right, you have a piece of shippable code. Right? So a very noble purpose. But by the way, yeah, a deliverable product increment. The problem is, is that typically they only work on the code, right? So by the time you end up in the last sprint, you've used up all the time, and only then you realize, holy crap, we don't have an environment to deploy into, right? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there's no time to actually do the architecture work. So the major kind of change is dev and ops are held responsible for developing not only the code to deploy, but the environment it deploys into, right? And then, you know, where do you use that environment? In dev. Right, and in the later sprints, you work on the downstream environments, keyway, staging, production. And these amazing kind of stories of like how this becomes an incredible sales tool, right? Because you can now ship a production environment right on the sales, uh, you know, on sales people's laptops, right? All that is just inherently synced, um, and then you're integrating information security, keyway into the daily sprint activities, right? So, uh, and we're never left behind. Um, another big piece is you know you take your most senior ops and you know here let's insert security into the dev structure right so they have a very special responsibility right whereas the developers typically feature uh, focus on user uh, functional requirements ops and security focus on the non-functional requirements right use cases and stories for ops what I love about agile right you know I know that you know it's not, it's not the panacea you know not all agile shops are actually very agile. But what is wonderful is, you know, if you can get those ops use cases in a story, that is actually the beginning of the standardization work. You can actually define, here is what ops work is, so the developers can finally understand that. And the same applies to security, right? They have a special vote. They have a vote just like any other team member. But, you know, they really require, their special responsibility is to bring in ops and security requirements, right, uh, into, you know, the source, right? So in other words, if we're helping train them, Hey, here's how the configuration settings should be you know, located. You know, here's what the default security settings should be. Right? Uh, here's you know, what the logging requirements are. And ops and dev, they, they can also pull the end on cord. Right? When they see something wrong happening, they can pull the cord just like an Toyota production line right? and stop the entire flow. Right? And you know, uh, we don't restart until we figure out how to prevent it from happening again. And that's the expectation. Right? So it's not people screaming at the poor security person saying, hey, we have a problem. That's kind of our job. And then kind of advanced concept, concept is, hey, you know, you know, when you have a sprint going every two weeks, what happens if you can actually do a deployment in 10 minutes? Right? You know, this is kind of exciting possibility that you decouple production releases from the sprint boundaries. Right? In other words, you don't have to wait till the end of the sprint to deploy. You can actually do minor code fixes, enhancements. You, know, you get a bunch of frowny faces in the uh, uh, service desk or in the user forums. Let's go ahead and fix it. We don't have to wait till the end. And that's kind of introducing this notion of migration from a sprint to a Kanban, whatever. Thing. So it's like all great things can happen like once you can get deployment times down. And um, so we talked about putting ops into dev. Now let's talk about putting dev into ops. Um, this is an amazing case study that was done by Bob Browser. Um, it was this really kind of cool startup where they, you know, they, what they did was basically use Amazon Web Services to spin up tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of instances to basically do load testing from the, the outside world. And uh, you know, they made a decision because they noticed that waking up developers at 3 a.m. is a great feedback loop. We found that defects got fixed really quickly, right? So I'll be honest, I had a sort of moral issue with you know, developers in production, <laughs> right? You know, uh, screwing around, doing what developers do. And we all know what developers do, right? You can't trust them. And I, by the way, my background is developed. Um, so, but I, I think I'm over that now, right? I mean, I think there is a very special cerebral exercise that you know, information security must 
uh, derive, which is what are the separation of duties right, requirements that are relied upon? When can you let developers you know, be level three support? When can they get access to production? How, how do you sort of manage that risk? No one's going to care except for information security. Um, okay. So our goal is to really sort of outline in prescriptive form uh, you know, how to do that. So just uh, before I conclude, and I'll go to the uh, panel, uh, uh, let me tell you about one other project that I'm just really excited about. Because this other book I'm working on called When IT Fails a Novel. And I think this, the goal here is really to help kind of create a vehicle so that the business people, application developers, operations all say, gosh, you know what? We all see this problem in information security. It's not just you, it's us, right? Uh, like any dysfunctional marriage, right? Uh, you know, we are as much to blame uh, as, as you, and we're willing to step up and solve our piece of the problem. Uh, it's, it's being written by the same team that uh, wrote the original Fitzwatts book. And what we're modeling it on is a book that probably had the biggest influence on my career uh, ever, right? And it's this book called The Goal. How many people here read The Goal? Um, awesome. So for those of you who haven't read it, I recommend reading it. It is like a phenomenal book. Here's what it's about. It was written in the 1980s about a guy, it's a novel about a guy named Alex. He's a plant manager, and he has to fix his cost and due date issues in 90 days, otherwise they're gonna shut the plant down. Right? And so for 170 days, and I've never managed a plant, but I'm like, oh my gosh, it was horrible reading it, because I'm like, I think I've seen this before. Right? I've seen it in a different context. And you really live the world through someone who's earnestly trying to figure out how to solve the problem, and is trying to piece together what is wrong about this assumption that's causing, almost inevitably, right, uh, for certain bad outcomes to happen. Um, this is now integrated in a lot of MBA programs, um, you know, around the world, and it sold something like three million copies, three million copies, uh, since it was published in 1984. Um, so here's kind of, you know, what we're writing is uh, a book that's really sort of meant to do the same thing before IT. So, so instead of one character, there are two characters. One is, uh, Character is Steve Master, the CEO of a four billion dollar year company, right? Retail and manufacturer. And the other character is Bill Palmer, the VP of IT operations, and uh, they're a four billion dollar year uh, revenue company. And Steve, the CEO, will often be heard saying, "We're not Google, we're not Microsoft. IT just isn't a core competency. If I can't delegate it away, maybe it's time we outsource it, right? You know, just you know, someone should take our mess for less, right? Uh, so, kind of the opening chapter is, you know." Uh, uh, Steve walks into a board meeting, and yeah, basically he's Circuit City competing against Best Buy. Right, the board is holding him accountable for late projects. Uh, you know, uh, uh, for, for third year of a SOX 404 repeat audit finding, uh, outages, security issues. Right, and so they said, hey, you know what? We're going to take your chairmanship away. You know, and maybe your days as CEO are over. Maybe we need some younger. You know, someone who understands technology to sort of lead this company to where it needs to go. Uh, so yeah, this doesn't make him happy, right? Uh, so he basically <laughs> now fires the CIO, who takes the VP of IT operations with him, and enters you know the hero, Bill Palmer, you know the AS400 director of operations, who's purposely tried to avoid VP uh, VP them, right? Because he knows that the, the life expectancy is very very low, right? Uh, he says no no no, I don't want the job, but then you know, finds that oh my god, you know, he couldn't resist you know the sales uh, job that uh, Steve did to him. And then uh, on the first day, he gets handed a payroll outage, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, all the salary employees got paid, none of the hourlies. Uh, and you know, he can't figure out what went wrong. Uh, but it turns out that uh, uh, you know, it was the sales guy, and it was the security people, right, who pushed the tokenization change to avoid the auditors. Yeah. Oh, I could see the wire that was the problem. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the auditors aren't abused. Second day is that uh, he walks into an audit finding where there are like 952 IT general control deficiencies. Uh, Bill's like, oh, geez, what, what, what have I done? I knew I shouldn't have taken this job. Uh, right, the, the business is uh, dismayed. And the third day, right, uh, he walks into a project management meeting where he gets thrown underneath the bus by the VP of application development and the VP of marketing, the evil Sarah, right, uh, who says, uh, we are deploying Project Phoenix, of which our survival depends on in 11 days. And the operations people are going, what? <laughs> that was supposed to be until next year, right? They're saying, no, you don't want to do this. You know, uh, terrible things will happen, but they don't listen to them. And so, uh, you know, uh, this is the outcome, right? And, uh, so the goal is, um, you know, just to share with you my motivation. The CIO of Columbia Sports where I said, Gene, when you finish that book, um, you know, not only will everyone on my team need to read it, 
dev on security, auditors even, right? But my boss will need to read it, and my boss's boss will need to read it, right? The CFO and the CEO. Right? It's like, you know, I think this will help frame the dysfunctional marriage between business and IT to at least have the other side understand each other and maybe gain a little bit of empathy. So that's a little bit about the book, and uh, I'll just take five minutes to share with you my favorite character in the book. Who is not a pri he's a secondary character, but he's one of the most complicated characters who actually makes the biggest transformation. So his name is John Pesci. He's been a CISO for nine years. He's 39 years old. He's been a very aggressive career climber, ex before auditor. And he was, um, you know, he's not very happy these days, right? Uh, he's haunted by uh, thoughts that he's going to be, you know, turned into the fall guy. He's going to be blamed for all the bad outcomes of business. Uh, you know, he went into security because he wanted to catch bad guys. Right? He's driven by a sense of duty, which uh, you know you have to do. Right? And so, you know, as he thinks about the humiliation he feels on a weekly basis as he begs the project managers to tell him where the dev people are meeting, right? Because he just wants to sit in. <laughs> and they're like, no, no, no. they're offsite. No, we can't tell you that, right? So uh, he realized that this is his self-image. Ideally, but this is how he feels, right? <laughs> um, and so his kids say, you know, Daddy, you're just not the person I remember you to be. His wife says, you know, uh, you're not the person I fell in love with, right? Whenever we drive, he gets this look on your face, your jaw clenches, right? I hate the person you've become, right? And, uh, you know, so John's not very happy. So there's basically three things that John sort of discovers, right, that uh, he holds very dearly. Um, and that turns out to be wrong, right? So assumption number one is John wins based on how much work he can put into the IT system. In other words, how much money can I steal from the developers and the operations people, right? How many vulnerabilities can I jam into the queue, right, and badger them to fix, right? Uh, how, can I, uh, how can I twist the arms of land managers, wherever, wherever they live, QA, development, operations, to sort of do my work for me, right? Because I'm driven by a sense of duty and, uh, and uh, moral good, right? And what he finds is, you know, kind of one of his aha moments is like, oh my gosh, he, by just paper, by, by jamming these controls into production, by fixing these things without going all the way to the source, he's actually just adding excess control complexity, right? And so he realizes his unique gift, right, has become the forebrain of the organization, that only he realizes what security controls are actually important, right, and which ones are the most important to fix that fix things systemically. Um, and he does this by and he can actually shrink the scope of audits, whether it's SOX 4.4 or PCI. Um, you know, he's the only person who's actually capable of doing this work, and he gets appreciated for it. Secondly, his second assumption that turns out to be wrong is that IT win, InfoSec wins when they can meddle with all sorts of daily work, just like this guy with the clipboard hovering over people as he type, right? It turns out, you know, he learns this wrong. Um, and he realized that he has to shift his focus from the work center level. By the way, I think the OWASP community in general right, is in such a better position than the operation security people, right? because we focus on the flow of work into production. That's where we should be focusing our efforts. He has a special gift right, that can facilitate the, relationship, facilitate the, uh, the dialogue between ops and dev and say, hey, there's a better way. We can actually do a rugged DevOps transformation where we can simultaneously get fast flow of features in production, which are simultaneously you know, uh, more scalable, available, survivable, sustainable, securable, etc. And the last assumption is there's a finite zero-sum game for information security. In other words, cycles for information security come at the expense of the other people in the group. And what John discovers is, hey, you know, by decreasing cycle time, by increasing flow, right, the entire pie grows. You know, operations you know, actually their constraint increases capacity by a factor of four x. The development release rate goes from quarterly to three times daily, right? And there's something magical that happens in the product management process where they say, you know what? We have to dedicate 10% of all our cycles for non-functional requirements, which include security, right? So now uh, the security backlog is finally being worked, and then consequently the security mean time to find and fix goes from quarters to days to hours, right? So we build a real sustainable uh, control environment that achieves compliance and security objectives. So, you know, the goal is really to replicate, you know, the results that we saw in the benchmarking studies, right? Simultaneously get uh, a control environment with the past audits, we find and fix security reaches faster, we're more operationally effective, and we're doing more public work, right? And orders of magnitude where we ever thought possible before. And so what does this mean for John? Hey, here's John realizing, oh my gosh, I'm loved, right? And here's the uh, entire organization applauding me, saying, hey, oh, thank you, John, you made the auditors go away, and 
you helped us discover this rugged, rugged DevOps thing, and here's a picture of John being invited to the office party, right? You know, for the first time ever. They say, hey, we're having a party on the uh, loading docks. Come, come join us, right? And like, oh, really? And they're like, no, we want you. We love you, right? And you know, John, uh, John gets to uh, have a loving relationship again. So, yeah. if you're interested, There's some new woman. Yeah, right, right. 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 Young different. Yes. Uh, if you're interested in any of the benchmarking, just email me. I'll send you the slides. If you're interested in benchmarking studies, uh, you know, I'll send you the. Uh, 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 the executive white papers. You know, uh, here's a uh, list of some of the resources I've used, and one of the uh, my favorite books is Inspired in terms of kind of training you know, product management. Is this book called Inspired? He was a product manager of the eBay service, and he was the person who had to sort of fix. For those of you who recall eBay in 1999, when they, they couldn't even stay up, you know, what did it feel like for him to sort of like you know end up in jail, losing his wife and kids, right, and saying, oh my gosh, we didn't pay down technical debt fast enough. Now he says 10% of all dev cycles must go to non-functional parties, which includes operations and security. If you want to learn more about DevOps, uh, you know, we'll have our book done, but you know, in the meantime, uh, the seminal work on this is called Continuous Delivery, which really defined, I think, was a stepping stone that enabled all of uh, DevOps. Uh, if you're interested in um, the books that I've talked about that we're working on, when Nike fails, or the DevOps bookstore, just mail me. Uh, you can just write a list. If you send me uh, slides or research, I'll send you that too. So with that, that really concludes the prepare for this presentation. And now, uh, let's, Adam, if you're up for this, um, I thought it would be interesting, but I'll leave it up to you. Although your feelings are very fragile, I actually wanted to introduce you to two people um, that uh, have a long history in service management who have to deal with people like you and me. <laughs> Right, uh, and I thought uh, I, w I actually have wanted to ask him two questions, and then open up for uh, however you want to spend the time. Um, so, Susan Ryan, could you come up here? She used to be the uh, head of service manager for Blue Cross Blue Shield here in Minnesota. Charlie Betts was uh, the enterprise architect and uh, also helped manage the ITSM program at uh, Wells Fargo. And then Young Vermont. Uh, well, she's not exactly an auditor, but she has a lot of friends that are auditors. Uh, but I. I, I, I he was actually the chair of the Hey, that's your. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought it would be interesting to. Uh... Who's the camera? Who's my camera? Sorry. Oh, maybe just another. <laughs> Question number one. And, uh, yes, I'm uploaded. Uh, <laughs> what advice would you give to an information security person who wants to help with application security, DevOps? Service management, you know, uh, what would, advice would you give to them who maybe have never dealt with someone like, like, like you? Uh, you let me start. I'll sure. Start. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Um, Just like in the rehearsal calls. Excuse me. Okay. So, um, <laughs> let me just back up a second. Um, I worked at Blue Cross Blue Shield for ten years. Five years in the service desk and then five years doing IT service management and building out our IT service management infrastructure, um, all the processes that we use, the tool that we implement on. Um, pretty much every ITIL initiative has a defining moment. Something that goes really badly and the senior management says, I don't care what it takes, fix it. And a lot of times the answer to that is ITIL. We'll fix it with ITIL, we'll fix it with repeatable process and we'll make it better. Well, our defining moment came in the, in the terms of a, uh, an audit finding that was material, or near material. Uh, it was an 0 for, 0 for 15. Zero out of 15 emergency changes recorded in the change management system. And the senior management said, I don't care what it takes, fix this, because this is going to go to our customers if we can't get this fixed. So that was my invitation to implement ITIL. Um, so I owe my ITIL experience to our IT risk management department. So I say, yay, thank you. Thank you. How nice. <laughs> I can see you guys now. <laughs> um, so um, my advice to information security, I guess, is to um, partner with IT service management. Um, you know, they were the reason that I got to start, and then I depended on them, I relied upon them throughout every process that we've worked on. Especially processes that were controls-based, change management, 
um, configuration management, things that required us to be keeping track of things in a very careful manner. And I met with them and said, tell me what I need to do to make sure I can pass the audit, sure, but really make sure that I'm not going to hurt my customers. What do I need to have in place to make sure that we're doing this correctly? Because you can help me. And so we would brainstorm and bounce ideas off of each other. And our process then developed with the controls in place that made it possible for us to do a good job and pass audits. When they came to audit, we said, here you go, no problem. Because we had everything in place in order to make sure that we could do that. So um, I would say work together with IT service management. and Because they need the help. They definitely <laughs> need the help. We needed the help from them, for sure. Same question? Yeah. Well, if uh, Wells Fargo, the environment was um, a, a little bit different, uh, just being so massively scaled. Uh, a little bit of context. The Wells Fargo annual IT budget is now about $6 billion a year. About $2 billion of that is spent provisioning and supporting infrastructure alone. Um, security is obviously a, a tremendous concern. And, but yet, one of the opportunities that I saw, again, was, was still the partnership.